Our next speaker will be Magdalena Balmaceda. Magdalena is the head of the Earth System Predictability section at ECMWF and also gave a lecture at our um, student colloquium a couple of weeks back. Thanks for that, Magdalena. And I think I'll. Okay. Uh, thank you, oh, uh, Anish and, and Judith, for giving me the opportunity to present some work from ECMWF. Let me share my screen. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some recent uh, work. Uh, this time is on seasonal forecast rather than sub-seasonal. Uh, and it's on the um, impact of recent uh, um, Indian Ocean variability on seasonal uh, forecast. There are two specific topics. Um, one is the Indian Ocean impact on the two-year El Niño of 2014, 15, 15 and 16, the implications for the two-year predictability. This is a, some research that has been published. Uh, the other is in preparation by Retis Senan and is the recent impact of the Indian Ocean SST anomalies on the positive NAO uh, of DJF in 2019 and 20. So I start with the first one. If for whatever the reason my, I get cut, please tell me because my Wi-Fi is not so good and I'm going to switch off my camera. Yeah. So let me go back to the presentation. So. Uh, motivated, I mean, we had a look at the big El Nino of 2015 and 16, and we compared it with the 97-98, that it was the previous larger El Nino in terms of sea surface temperature anomaly. And uh, we, this, uh, we had a look at the energetics, the energy budget. So during El Nino, we know that the Ocean Pacific discharges his, its heat, and quite a lot of it goes uh, to the atmosphere, as we can see here for 97-98. The net balance of ocean heat uh, content before and after El Nino in 97-98, it was quite a large discharge. I cannot remember the units, but uh, uh, sorry, I realized that uh, they are not there. And uh, well, that was just a diagram of uh, what is the energy cycle uh, for 97-98. And in contrast for 2015 and 16, uh, the ocean, hit, the Pacific Ocean, the tropical Pacific didn't discharge. It continued quite well charge of heat. Uh, and the impact on the atmosphere was substantially smaller. So it didn't um, um, release so much energy into the atmosphere. So, uh, but there was a big difference between the two events uh, and that it was due to the Indonesian through flow. Uh, the, you know that during the El Nino, the Indonesian through flow weakens and there is not so much heat export into the Indian Ocean. So if we talk anomalies, it's equivalent to um, anomalous import of heat. And that was extremely large in 2015 and 16. And you can see it on terms of time series from ocean reanalysis that the uh, volume and heat fluxes uh, associated with Indonesian um, through flow were really unprecedented. Uh, it's very weak. And um, this uh, also can be seen I mean, in, the, in the strength of the Indonesian uh, through flow is proportional to the sea level gradients between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. So, uh, we started investigating why was uh, what happens. Why was the Indian Ocean, uh, so the Indian um, Indonesian through flow so weak during this year? So those are the questions that we were trying to answer. Was this weakening predictable? Uh, the Indonesian through flow uh, transport predictable at internal time scales. What was the role of the Indian Ocean state uh, on this weakening? Uh, did the Indian Ocean state influence the weak El Nino of 2014 and 15 and the strong of 2015? Um, and does the Indian Ocean state influence the predictability of Enzo in the two in the second year more generally? 
So for that, to answer these questions, we set up a seasonal um, forecasting experiment based on system five, uh, the operational system, up to 24 months, starting the 1st of February, uh, 2014. And the experiments consisted on uh, swapping the Indian Ocean initial conditions, uh, replacing the ones in 2014 by the ones in 1997, and combinations of the kind. And we launched several 50 ensemble members. So uh, this is the preamble to see whether the methodology will work. The first thing that we can see on the right hand side is the Indonesian through flow. Uh, we see the black line is the reanalysis. Uh, accumulated over the two years, and we see that the seasonal forecast indeed uh, captured this weakening. I mean, positive values means towards the Pacific. When we replace the Indian Ocean by mm, components of 97, 98 Indian Ocean, this Indian mm, mm, Indonesian through flow doesn't weak. Uh, that's uh, uh, so there is indication that the Indian Ocean matters and is predictable as well. Um, and then the other thing was what uh, was the impact of that on Enzo. Here we see Hoffmuller diagrams. Uh, this is the observed anomalies from reanalysis, 97 minus 2014 in sea surface temperature, heat content, uh, sonar winds, and velocity potential across the equator. And you can see that these two events, 97 was much stronger than 2014, and it was followed by La Nina. Well, in 2014, uh, I mean, 2015 was a very big El Nino. That was a big difference. And you can see it in sea surface temperature, and you see this uh, huge propagation of a negative anomaly uh, of heat content as well, and the different uh, um, uh, feedbacks, the Viernet feedbacks as well. So uh, in our experiments, seasonal forecast experiments, if we take the forecast in 97 minus the forecast in 2014, we see that they capture to a certain extent, the ensemble mean captures this strength, uh, stronger uh, warming in year one and stronger cooling in year two. And now we go to the um, swap experiments. Uh, and uh, here, what uh, I'm showing is the difference, the impact of the experiment where we put the Indian Ocean um, initial condition from 97 minus the, the reference. Uh, everything else is like in 2014. And you can see that, in, in fact, the Indian Ocean in 97 would have produced a much warmer ENSO in year one, and it would have produced a colder event in year two. And you can also see the indication of uh, some Indian Ocean dipole developing in the autumn of the first year. Uh, you can also see that there is a, quite a large signal in the second year coming in the, mm, uh, in the ocean heat content. If we just uh, change the Indian Ocean in the surface in the upper 20 meters, we see that some impact uh, just coming from the atmospheric bridge. Uh, but uh, we see that impact, and that's visible in the first year, but it's not so visible in the second year. So uh, uh, looking at extremes, what we looked is classify the different types of events, extra, strong El Nino, moderate warming, neutral or La Nina. Uh, in the for year one and year two, and in 2014, we saw that most of the ensemble members predicted moderate El Nino with some extreme. That contrasted very much with the 97-98, where the probability of very extreme El Nino was quite high. And also we see the probability of very strong La Nina. Uh, uh, when we swap the ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean, what we see is the, in the probability of the warm event with 97-98 uh, Indian Ocean, it increased the probability of extreme El Nino, and also increased the probability of La Nina in the second year. So this is a clear indication that the Indian Ocean affects the predictability uh, in both years of extreme events. And in these other diagrams, what we try to say is to condition that up to the strength of the Indonesian through flow. The Indonesian through flow is a weak, no, it's a strong with the 97-98. And the ones that they have a strong ITF, they tend to produce La Nina in the second year, as we can see here. 
uh, and with weak ITF, we, the PDF is shifted to the right uh, towards warm conditions the second year. Uh, and this Indonesian through flow, uh, I'm going to go quite quickly here, is clear, this difference, this weakening is clearly different from the interannual variability from the impact of El Nino. So the, the difference that the, we have cannot um, be attributed to the impact of El Nino. It has to be something else. So the questions are raising is what caused that unprecedented weakening? And one possibility is the, PD, the preceding PDO event because it's consistent with this in, in each of the sea level um, gradient across the maritime continent. So, and the preceding PDO, the winds will have raised the sea level in the Indian Ocean and um, favor a weakening of the, of the through flow. So what are the prospects of the predictability of ENSO, GR2, um, for two years time scale? Uh, and what are the windows of opportunities that have such change related to changes in the PDO? Uh, there is also the implication for interpreting the seasonal forecast. As you know, in 2014, uh, we were very eager to announce a big El Nino coming, but actually the forecasts were quite probabilistic. Uh, had we had the second year, the two years forecast, and had we seen the probability of extreme El Nino was already there in, for the second year and not probability of La Nina, maybe we had issued a different, uh, interpreted the forecast differently. And um, so that's one part. The second part, it has to do uh, with this um, positive NAO over, um, um, that affected the weather over Europe in 2019 and 20, DJF. Uh, you can see here in uh, ira 5, I show seasonal forecast, but it was most of the seasonal forecasting model predicted this very well, which is an unusual occurrence uh, because the NAO usually is, uh, is poorly predicted. And so we tried to say, okay, what um, we had the option, repeat the same experiments, but not with the couple model, but with observed SSDs. We also have similar results. And this uncoupled uh, uh, experimentation will allow us to, to, to ask, answer some questions. What was the role of the sea surface temperature anomalies in different basins? You can see here that in 2019 and 20, there were very strong SST anomalies in the Indian Ocean. And that were very well predicted. So uh, we did that. Uh, there are several experiments here. I only show the results from two. Uh, in the left column, it shows the impact of the, um, when we have the system five with observed SST, another experiment where we replace the Indian Ocean with climatological values. And in this case, in the right column is when we replace the, the Pacific Ocean with climatological values. And you see um, uh, 200, Pascal uh, meridional winds, uh, 200 hectopascal geopotential height, and the Rossby wave source. So you can see that the NAO uh, uh, footprint is much stronger, uh, is strong associated with the Indian Ocean SST anomalies. So the results are mm, mm, consistent with a gill type response to heating, tropical heating, plus westward propagation of Rossby waves. So this westward propagation is a little bit um, uh, not so common because traditionally we only think on Rossby wave propagating eastward. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, they have to travel a long way before reaching Europe. And that's probably that was the reason for the low predictability. But uh, several studies among them, one that it, it explains it very well is Shaman and Zipperman in 2016, sorry. Uh, is that if you have not sonally symmetric flow, but sonally asymmetric flow, and with very low uh, sonal wave numbers, this westward propagation is possible, um, especially on the North Africa and Egypt, because you have very high values of potential vorticity gradients and the sonal um, flow is not so strong. That means that the geographic proximity of the Indian Ocean to Europe, it will favor the predictability and the signal to noise ratio. Further experiments uh, uh, show that this response is modulated by the amplitude of the Indian Ocean oh, uh, SST and also by modulated by ENSO. So in 2019, 
18, there was no answer and that favored the strong response over you. Again, so, two more minutes. Yeah, I just uh, finished after showing these oh. results. Uh, and these two examples, uh, is, uh, to my mind, they show that the variability of the Indian Ocean has serious implications for seasonal forecasts. And both the weak ITF in 2014 and 16 was responsible for the two year warm event uh, uh, that was likely predictable. One conjecture is that this weak ITF was induced by the preceding PDO phase. It could be by climate change, but it's a question, uh, it's an invitation uh, to opinions. Uh, the, um, the other one was the unprecedented high seasonal predictability of the NAO in DJA is attributed to the Indian Ocean anomalies. If these SST anomalies that they are linked to climate change uh, continue to raise, it may have implication for seasonal predictability over Europe. Uh, both cases have implications for the design and interpretation of seasonal forecast uh, uh, system. Uh, so how to extract information from a seasonal forecast in a context of a climate, uh, changing climate. A first option, that's what we do now, uh, is to have long enough records of reforecast. But um, even if we could afford it, would this be enough? Uh, would it be a good assessment of a scale in a non-stationary climate? Because we may be, uh, we may see next year, we may see the unseen. <laughs> and so do we need to have more insight uh, into the processes leading to uh, uh, involved in the, predict in the predictions? And the second question is, uh, do we think, do, do you think that seasonal outlooks of ENSO at the second years would be, would be useful? And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Maclina. It was yeah, really interesting impacts of the Indian Ocean. Uh, any questions for Magdalena? So I had one, Magdalena. You mentioned about the climate change aspect as well and how it would impact uh, future prediction, right? And the Indian Ocean seems to be the region where the warming, at least as per historical records, the warming is more than other regions and other global oceans. And how much would this trend be a source of predictability versus it would make um, the scale worse in the future if it continues this way and the Indian, Indian Ocean continues to warm more than the Pacific, for instance, would, would that help improve the seasonal prediction? Because there is the trend and maybe the model can pick up on the trend or would it make it more difficult with the Indian in Indonesian through flow um, yeah. changing? I mean, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I mean, I made the link with climate change because it's the gut feeling, uh, but this yeah. has to be demonstrated indeed. Uh, so yeah. I think there is a lot to, of research to do. So there are two aspects regarding the, uh, the Indian Ocean impact over Europe. The response seems to be quite, um, um, uh, if you, um, depends on the amplitude. You could imagine yeah. that if the Indian Ocean SST continue to rise, the only thing is that they may not rise out in thin items. So uh, right. how, uh, <laughs> how, uh, how, uh, so, but uh, um, there will be a saturation point, but it will have implications. So I think we need to, to understand. Um, yeah. But it's true that there are con um, contrasted uh, impacts because on one hand you have the Indian Ocean warming, but also the Indian Ocean warming could in the, more warming in the Pacific okay. the, via yeah. the Indonesian through flow. Right. So yeah. maybe there are competing yeah. impacts. And here, in this case, they were very isolated cases. If we put the two together, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good okay. question. Great. Thanks, Martina. Jan? You have a question in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Magdalena, for this great talk. Um, very impressive results. Um, I was wondering the results you showed with the winter 1920 um, and the higher predictability for the NAO. I remember that there was also a strong um, polar vortex in the stratosphere. 
And so I was wondering if you looked at the um, influence of that on the overall predictability of the NAO and especially with the combination, the combination to the results you showed, if there was an influence yeah. on that. Yeah. We have looked a little bit. Uh, so the Indian Ocean seems to have also an impact on the strengthening of the polar vortex. But in our predictions in system, at least in our system, those are largely canceled by the impact of the Pacific. So the, the polar vortex and the eastward propagation of uh, uh, Rossby waves in our system, and the Pacific and the Indian Ocean cancel each other. Okay. More or less. So the source of, uh, uh, well, cancer, mostly. I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, of eastward propagation of Rossby wave, but the um, sources of potential of Rossby wave at the exit of the jet, they are in the opposite direction, both of them. And the same with the polar vortex. Uh, the outcome is that the Pacific influences dominate. Uh, so the, probably the polar vortex doesn't strengthen as much in our in our model as in observations, but it's huge spread, by the way. So we don't know whether it's predictable. Thank you very much for the very good question. Yeah, yeah thanks for explaining it. Okay, thanks, Jan. And thanks again, Mike Jane. That was really fascinating talk and new findings with seasonal prediction. And yeah. yeah.